I will be a Jew. You want me to be a Jew? Okay, I'll be a Jew. Oh, what is your take? Oh, it's funny that you mentioned that. What is your take on the IUIC movement? Um, I, I, I have done some content on Hebrew Israelites in the past. I had vocab alone on my show. I did a video, uh, where I was providing some commentary to Creflo Dollar and how IUIC confronted him on his property and how I felt that somebody there should have engaged with them. Um, I'll say this about IUIC or any of the camps. I fundamentally disagree with them because they add to the gospel. What do I mean by that? Whenever there is a movement that has a heavy emphasis on the ethnicity or the national heritage and your faith being predicated upon that, um, we don't see that in the scriptures, right? We have the entire testimony of scripture. Right. We can't just go to Deuteronomy 28. But I see right here, this is the black people. Well, one. That's not true. And if we need to have a discussion, if we need to exegete Deuteronomy 28 in context to demonstrate that, you know, we can. Um, that's not the topic of the show, but we can. But um, the whole book of Galatians, like Paul pinned that because we had the Judaizers. Right. I, I would put IUIC in the same category. I would call them modern day Judaizers. They have issues with the sufficiency of Christ alone and his finished work being sufficient to save us and redeem us from the curse of death and sin, right? They want us to say, yeah, we believe that, but we have to do this. We have to keep these laws. We have to do the feast days. We have to do, we've got to do all these things, right? When the new covenant, the New Testament believer, we are under the law of Christ, right? The Mosaic law had its purpose and its purpose was to show us just how jacked up and sinful we were and that even on our best day, we cannot keep the Mosaic law, right? It is a model, but the law of Christ is what governs the New Testament believer. And the entire book of Galatians, if you read it from chapter one through the rest of the book, you will see Paul appealing to the fact that someone had bewitched them. Someone bewitched them to make them think. Matter he says it. I am astonished. This is Galatians 1, verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 5. Verse 6? Verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. What was this other gospel that Paul was talking about, right? Um, my notes here has, where is it? Uh, it was a remarkably short time between Paul's first proclamation to the Galatians and their present disarray. The phrases deserting him and different gospels show that these are not issues over which Christians might legitimately disagree. When he says another gospel, this is not, you know, are we, you know, having chicken at the potluck or are we doing Caesar salad? Like th th these were theological issues. It's a different gospel. My notes show that the Galatians are questioning the very gospel itself. And Paul is a model of forthright frankness when central gospel issues are at stake. The apostle Paul addressed it head on. He goes, not that there is another one. Like he like, I don't know no other gospel, all right? But there are some who trouble you and want to distort, meaning they want to change the gospel of Christ into something else other than the gospel that was declared and preached by the apostles, right? Then he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, he says some very, very harsh language. Let him be accursed. 
Then he repeats himself. He's like, in case you ain't hear me the first time, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching, I don't care who the teacher of Israel is, this teaching is, I don't care the rabbi, I don't care the synagogue, I don't care the Gentile, I don't care. He goes, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel, a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. Um, and then he goes on to talk about, for I'm seeking approval, approval of man or of God. Because if I was seeking approval of man, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ Jesus. Um, when you read on, Paul asserts his apostleship by telling you, listen, this gospel, like I once taught it by men. This is how I received what I've been telling y'all. Then he talks about, you know, the vetting process he had to go through with the other apostles. And then he talks, Paul started talking, posing Peter to his face. Why? Because why, why was Paul opposing Peter to his face? He goes, but when Cephas, Paul, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Well, why? Why did Cephas stand condemned? What was Cephas doing that got Paul in such a tizzy? He goes, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Everything's fine. He's eating with the Gentiles. These are my brothers, you know, in Christ. We want in Christ Jesus. I'm eating with them. Pete, Paul, Cephas, Paul, Peter is. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Who is the circumcision party? He's talking about the Judaizers, the Jews, those of the circumcision party, the ones who were, were circumcised. We're doing the feast days. We're obeying the law of Moses. We're doing this, 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 and this. He's fearing them. So now in him, instead of him displaying the unity, right, with the Gentiles as being one in Christ Jesus, he started acting brand new and was like, mm, let me draw back because I don't want the Jews to see me with y'all. He says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So not only is he wilding now, he causing other brothers to stumble because now they right along with him. They're like, well, Peter's was drawn from them. So let us just follow his example. It says, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. What is this hypocrisy he's speaking of? The gospel of Christ says, we are justified by grace through faith, not of works. Meaning." The feast days, all the law keeping, all of the things that we did under the Mosaic Covenant, all it was was a foreshadow of what was to come to show us our sin. No one has ever been justified by keeping the law perfectly. Why? Because you can't. You can't keep it perfectly, right? It served its purpose. Jesus comes to fulfill all righteousness. So when the gospel of Christ is preached, and people are believing on the gospel by faith and they're baptized and they're being added to the church. You got some folks of the circumcision party that's trying to take people back into the bondage of the Mosaic law. But it's like, well, no, wait a minute. We're free in Christ Jesus. We're under the law of Christ now. So he goes, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, he's like, I'm confronting you in front of everybody. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? That's a question, right? Peter was guilty of hypocrisy because though he had been happily living like a Gentile, right? He's living, he's his freedom in Christ, living like a Gentile. Remember, Gentiles were never under the Mosaic Covenant, when they accept Christ, believe on Christ, and are baptized by faith through grace, not of works, so they can't boast, Peter's living like them, then all of a sudden, like, because Gentiles didn't observe food laws, right? He's now requiring Gentile Christians to observe Jewish table regulations if they wanted to eat with him. 
So Paul's like, nah, we we not doing that. I'm about to oppose you to your face, you and Barnabas and the rest of y'all. Such a requirement, however, would undermine the gospel itself by how making justification depend on works of the law rather than faith in Christ Jesus. Because Peter's sin was a public sin, that was setting a bad example for the church. Paul confronted him publicly, compare the different procedure that Jesus commands regarding a private sin against an individual person, which hopefully can be corrected privately. So Paul is confronting Peter publicly because his public sin was causing others to stumble and, lead, and just ride on in the same hypocrisy. So to answer your question, what is your take on the IUIC movement? They need the gospel of Christ, just like every other sinner born under the curse of Adam. I that my argument is the same that you don't have to like it. I get it. Right. But. My justification is not predicated upon me recognizing that I'm a Jew. OK, let's let's just say I'm a Jew. Let's say I just bow down and admit it. Now what? Still doesn't earn me right standing with God. Right. All it does is raise me up in ethnic pride. And now I start thinking I'm special and that I don't have unity with all those from every tribe, tongue and nation that are being added to the church because I'm a Jew. Right. What? What? I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. Now, I know their argument is the slave trade brought us on shift. And that's why black folks have all these problems. That argument cannot be substantiated historically or biblically. It doesn't even make exegetical sense when you read it in its context. So my answer and admonition to them in any other camp is still the same. They need to abandon this works righteousness. It is an oppressive system. They are literally trying to force you to live under the law again. And they can't even do it. They can't. The freedom in Christ says, look what Christ has done. Repent of your works righteousness, trying to earn right standing and justification and believe on what he's already done. Recognize your sinfulness. When you see that law, all of the laws, the dietary ones, all of them, you look at it and you're like, I don't measure up. I cannot do this. But somebody did. And who was that somebody? It was Christ Jesus, our Lord, the one born of a virgin, right? Who was fully God and fully man. And he lived under the law and he obeyed every single one perfectly. He fulfilled all righteousness. And so my justification is predicated upon what Christ has done. Not what I do. Now, what that does not mean is that I continue in sin and live like I want. Because people who've been born from above, who's been regenerated and given a new heart, they don't live how like they want. They're submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. And we obey because we've been justified. We don't obey to obtain justification. That is the category difference. You must understand the difference. I obey out of my love and what Christ has done for me. Not because if I do this, I'll be accepted. He's already, atonement has meaning. And Christ's atonement was definite and specific and it was complete. Christ didn't die for sin to atone for it. And then I have to add my righteousness to it in order for it to be a full righteousness. That's not how it works. When, when the animal was slain, right, there had to be a blood sacrifice. Christ's blood is sufficient. He literally is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. For his people, he died for his people. For his people, they're not just the Jews. Gentiles, there are Gentiles, there are sheep that are not of this fold. He came to save the lost sheep of Israel. Absolutely. But he also died for those. I'm a Gentile. 
There's, there's no way to historically force me being a Jew upon me. You can't do a DNA test and say, yep, see here, right here, she's a Jew. And even if you could, what does it matter? It earns me no right standing before a righteous and holy God because I'm going to stand before him clothed in my Jewish unrighteousness, guilty. I'm still guilty, even if you want to say, I am a Jew. Galatians 3. There's no, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how more clear. Like, I, I am perfectly okay with letting all of Scripture speak. Tota Scriptura. I, I submit myself to scripture alone, but all of it. I'm not throwing out Paul because he says stuff I don't like. I'm not throwing out James because I think he's in opposition with Paul. He's not. The scriptures are wholly sufficient. And in their context, with the Holy Spirit living on the side of me, I can clearly see that Galatians completely dispels the whole idea that I need to be a Jew in order to be saved. The whole book. Just read it in its context. Galatians 3. The righteous shall live by faith. Works of the law has never justified anyone. If that was the case, we wouldn't have to constantly make sacrifices over and over again and needing a priest. Jesus is our high priest. He, sat, he made the sacrifice. He sat down. Like, it's finished. That's it. Our wicked hearts always want to add something else to it. We always want to just add our little hint of what we think is going to be acceptable and sufficient. Retire from your work and rest in the sufficiency of Christ. That is my message to the Hebrew Israelites. I don't even have to get into the weeds about whether I'm a Jew or not. Okay, I will be a Jew. You want me to be a Jew? Okay. I'll be a Jew. It still does not satisfy the righteous requirement that I am going to fail to meet because I'm sinful and wicked. It don't even matter. I will concede. Okay, I'm Jewish. Fine. Great. Now, how do I get justified? How do I, how do I stand before a righteous and holy God who can't look upon sin, clothed in my own righteousness? Is it how many feast days I kept? Well, what happens if I had, you know, a uh, uh, Charlie uh, obstacle, uh, Velma, Isaiah, David, 19. What if I had that and I missed the feast day? What happens? Oh, I gotta, what am I going to do? I already failed. James tells us if we, if we strive to keep the whole law and we fail in one point, we are guilty of all of it. God doesn't just require, well, just do your best and he'll, he'll just explain away the fact that you, you stumbled in some. No, he demands perfection. And since you can't do perfection, you need a righteous substitute. You need a righteousness that is not your own. Your Mima's righteousness. The, the, the bishop of brimstone's righteousness. I don't care whoever's righteousness. You want to stand before God with clothing. The only righteousness that can fulfill the law perfectly is the righteousness of the Messiah. Yeshua. I, I know y'all got issues with Jesus because ain't no J. Fine. I don't want to cause you to stumble. Call who, who was born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem, in, in Bethlehem, in the city of David. That one, that Jesus, not Caesar Borgia, the one with the blonde hair, the blue eyes. I don't, I don't have to get in the weeds of all of that because it don't matter. Why does it matter? You know why it matters so much? Because your sinful heart is a factory of idols and you need an idol. You you need something to worship that looks like you because the idol is you. You need somebody who looks like you to give you identity when your identity should be hidden and found in Christ. So no, I don't need to be a Jew to be saved. I can be my wretched Gentile self 
and be accepted because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ and in him alone. That's it. Anything you want to add to that? You're like, well, what about, th there you go, that you're adding to the gospel. It is Christ and nothing else. That is it. And I obey the law of Christ that is revealed in the new covenant because my heart has been changed and I no longer want to walk according to the path of this world, fulfilling my fleshly desires. This is why I don't know any Israelite who doesn't have a war with their flesh. They, they, they live in sin just like, just like the pagans do. But they think because I, I, I fulfilled this feast day and I did this and I don't eat this and I don't eat that 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 somehow is going to justify me. It ain't good enough. Rest from your labor, rest from your working and stand in the finished work of what Christ has done. That is the gospel. And I get it. A lot of these churches out here, they're not preaching the gospel of sin and the, the good news of the gospel, repentance from sin and turning from sin. They don't preach that. They live just like the pagans do. Those ain't those, that those, those are not the churches. I get it. You got church hurt. We all do. We all do. These a lot of these professed Christian churches are dens of Satan. They don't preach the gospel. The pastors are unqualified. They cannot teach. They cannot answer your questions because they don't know the scriptures. But that is still no excuse to bind yourself under the law of Moses in an effort to earn some righteousness because you just need some structure. When you're born from above, the structure you seek, the, the, the righteous and holy life that you believe that you should live, Christ lives it through you. So abandon the work. You're working. There's no joy. There's no fruit of the spirit. You don't have that there because you're trying to attain some, a righteousness within your own strength and you can't do it. Uh, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Right. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm sure my ancestors, you know, they, they may have been wonderful people. Okay. Um, it's by God's grace. Let's, Let's just say that my ancestors were slaves. And let's just say that our own people sold my people to some other people and brought me, my ancestors, on some ships. And they endured some horrific hardships. That, that happened. Now, I don't, I don't know with 100% certainty what my ancestors did. But let's just say that that happened. God was sovereign over that. He was sovereign over that because I would not. And I know the Israelite would argue, oh, well, you you worship that white Jesus because that's the Jesus of the slave master. Is it, though? Because um, none of us know what Jesus looked like. We know he was a Jew. Um, but even if that's so, do I harbor hatred in my heart? against the wicked slave master? Do I, do I hold the same contempt for the wicked slave master that I did for my own ancestors who for weapons or money or tobacco or whatever they exchanged in exchange for the human lives that they sold? Do, do I have, I mean, I'm not supposed to have hatred in my heart for any of them, but I'm just wondering, are the scales equal there? Because all I see is a bunch of hatred. I don't see the law of Christ that says, like, I, 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 I got to forgive and let that bitterness go. Black people are not flourishing in this country, and it ain't because white people just doing stuff to us. Some of us just make bad decisions, and we need a scapegoat. Some of us got some bad advice. Some of us, mama one there, fatherlessness, we just, we got dealt the hand that we got dealt. Okay. What you going to do now? You, you're going to complain about it. You're going to whine about it. And you're going to be mad at white people. Like I can't, I can't live my life mad at white people who didn't do anything personally to me. Like I'm not just about to impugn an entire people group because some white people did something. 
they were wicked and sinful. And they're no more wicked and sinful than my ancestors who sold my other ancestors from another tribe into slavery to a European. I'm sorry, I just, I just can't, like the oppressive, the oppression narrative, they, like that's not my stick. It's just, I, I'm not cut from a cloth of people who whine and complain about what somebody else did to them. That's just not, that's just not me. Maybe it just ain't in my genes. I don't know. Um, but in our, in our family, like we don't do excuses. We don't, we, we accept responsibility for what we did wrong. We learn from our mistakes and we just move on. There, people are going to wrong you. Okay. We, we're not special. We're not the only people group who've been oppressed, who've been enslaved. The Egyptians enslaved the Jews, the Jew. I mean, come on. Like really, that's what we, I'm not playing this game with y'all. I'm just not. I am perfectly okay with God being sovereign and man being responsible. And uh, I, I just have no desire to impugn sinful motives to people, complete strangers who've done nothing to me. I don't harbor that hatred in my heart. Considering like if my white girlfriends, if their fathers or grandfathers or father's fathers own slaves, what does that have to do with them? Like, they like, I don't even know him. It's silly. It's silly. Like, let's just, let's just, come on, y'all. Let's do better. Let's do better. Let's be better. Let's be Christ-like and learn to forgive. Because all that hatred, all it does is harbor more resentment and unforgiveness and make you more bitter. And um, the last thing we needed is another black bitter person. Like, I just, I, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be bitter. I don't. I want to be happy and have joy in my heart because I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Like, that's me. I just, that mean that everything's peachy king. Like, this is a hard, this is a hard life, right? Lord never promised us that every day was going to be perfect and sunny. I can't appreciate the good days if I don't have bad days. How do I demonstrate a heart of gratitude and gratefulness if, I, if I've never gone through anything to say he brought me out of that and thank God I'm still here? It's this is the perspective for me. So, so that is my answer. Um, no, I'm not going to apologize for it. It is what it is. And um, I hope that answers the question. Amen. Thank you.